let's conclude with our final discussion. As we move towards an understanding of a way forward for countering terrorism in all forms and ideologies, we should first highlight the key trend that informs this path forward. First, the violent far-right extremist threat is increasingly transnational, connecting a network of like-minded groups and individuals internationally to share ideas, tactics, trainings, and even fund. Second, Violent far-right extremist groups are diverse in their objectives. Some are avowedly racist, some are anti-government, some are driven by conspiracy theories, but they all share a common thread of white supremacy extremism as part of their foundational ideology. Third, as for the status of the global jihadist terrorist threat, little progress, unfortunately, has been made in confronting and targeting the Salafi jihadist ideology which ensures the persistence of this global threat. Fourth, there's something in common among violent extremists and terrorist actors, which is they all adhere to violence and terrorism as a necessary way to bring about the collapse of the current state of government. Such groups employ violence as an integral tactics towards their overall strategy. White supremacists promote accelerationism, we spoke about that earlier. Similarly, Al-Qaeda's strategy in this regard was detailed at length in the management of savagery. Fifth, violent extremists and terrorist groups are increasingly capitalizing on the exponentially scalable engagement and visibility facilitated through social media, often radicalizing and recruiting vulnerable populations in the online space. For example, ISIS is a pioneer in terrorist use of social media for a variety of purposes, such as soliciting financing, recruiting fighters, establishing legitimacy, and instilling fear in its adversaries. Finally, the increased threat of attacks perpetrated by self-directed individuals, or what people call lone wolves, rather than large-scale attacks by a central operational core indicates a trend towards low-cost, low-tech approaches, this making funding harder to track. Since September 11th, much of the domestic and international frameworks to counter the financing of terrorism, CFT, were based on the threat of large-scale attacks requiring large amounts of money. As a result, CFT and sanctions measures have targeted Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and their affiliates largely through domestic and UN sanctions, imposing asset freezes and travel bans. While these mechanisms remain necessary, new strategies are required to track smaller scale extremist financing as well. Now, in offering a pass forward, it's critical to assess best practices from counterterrorism efforts of the past two decades. In the wake of the attacks on September 11, 2001, the international community developed international policies and legal practical framework to strengthen international cooperation. They developed new norms and helped states build counterterrorism capacities. However, this strategy focused on the major threats to international peace and security at the time, Al-Qaeda and ISIS. The ideological range of threats today has significantly expanded. Looking first to the multilateral sphere, what can international actors do to comprehensively address the broad range of violent extremist threats across the ideological spectrum, including transnational components of violent white supremacy extremism? First, raise awareness and build international partnerships that recognizes the emerging threats and trends in terrorism. States often vow to combat terrorism in all its forms and manifestations, but there has been little awareness raising or political condemnation of violent white supremacy extremism. Raising awareness and shaping the discourse on terrorism should remain a priority. Second, build on existing counterterrorism capacity building efforts to ensure these can address a range of terrorist threats improving border management, strengthening aviation security, and boosting international legal and law enforcement cooperation 
all lay the foundation for countering a range of terrorist threats, including evolution of terrorist financing. These activities need to include ways of fighting violent far-right groups. Third, international bodies like the United Nations can play a role in developing sanctions and measures more targeted at the violent far-right groups that have clearly articulated international connections. The private sector also has a key role to play in combating terrorism and violent extremism. Social media companies' policies and algorithms continue to allow manipulation and abuse by violent extremist and conspiracy groups. While necessary to protect freedom of speech, social media companies must re-examine their deplatforming uh, de approaches, design of algorithms, and the prevalence of disinformation on their platforms, including from foreign, from foreign influence campaigns. The private sector, governments, and civil society organizations should also collaborate to comprehensively address this disinformation terrorism nexus through initiatives like digital literacy programs, which can help build individuals' resistance to radicalization and recruitment online. Finally, fatigue appears to have set in on the counterterrorism front. The Biden administration's recent national security strategic guidance appears to move the United States away from its counterterrorism efforts and in favor to a geopolitically focused policy that take into account great power competition. The pendulum has swung back towards nation states. The threat encapsulated by geopolitics with countries such as Iran and North Korea and great power competition with Russia and China became the focus in Washington, D.C. However, this is not an either-or scenario. The United States must be able to conduct counterterrorism operations to address threats from non-state actors while competing with its primary nation state's adversaries. Moreover, the threat posed by terrorist and violent extremists are not always mutually exclusive from those posed by states who may manipulate regional allies and proxies. Over the past two decades, the United States has invested massive amounts of human resources, energy, and financial resources to develop a comprehensive worldwide counterterrorism infrastructure. This includes tactical and operational innovations, world-class intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance capabilities, and enduring security cooperation partnerships with countries from the Sahel to Southeast Asia. The United States also spearheaded a number of efforts in the international sphere, including an unprecedented and sweeping international legal framework through the United Nations Security Council, and spearheaded also the establishment of the Global Counterterrorism Forum. There is great risk in ignoring these capabilities. Russia and Iran in particular lie at the seam of counterterrorism and power competition. Russian separatists in the Ukraine and the Houthis in Yemen are both well-trained, violent non-state actors backed by strong nation states equipped with high-tech weaponries, including an array of sophisticated missiles. As we have seen in Yemen, in Iraq, in Lebanon, we've seen in Syria and Libya, and even in the Nori Karabakh region, Russia and Turkey and Iran have each enjoyed varying degrees of successes through the use of private military companies, foreign fighters, and sectarian militias. Working through these non-state actors has become the preferred means of operating in many cases because they rely on ambiguity while seeking to avoid direct escalations. As such, this is another trend we are likely to see more in the future. The Biden administration must ensure that counterterrorism addressing threats across ideologies, remain an integral part of the comprehensive approach to the United States national security and cannot be wholly divorced from geopolitical co power competition with regional states and near power adversaries. In the fight against transnational terrorism and violent extremism, all states play an important role. 
We have seen over 100 countries represented in the tens of thousands of people that have traveled to conflict zones to help Al Qaeda and ISIS. We see a similar trend of international travels in support of violent right wing extremist causes. No country can address this transnational threat alone. We need comprehensive approaches to counter terrorism that account for threats across the ideological spectrum. I thank you all for joining me today. It was an honor to join the Salah and Sarwat Malik lecture series. I wish Dr. Salah Malik a happy retirement from the college and every success in the future. I thank my host at SUNY Brookport for bringing us all together and I look forward to staying connected with you all in the future. Thank you all again.